The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe Relative to the strangest and yet most familiar story that I am going to extend in writing. I do not wait or request credit. It would truly be foolish to expect it in a case where my senses give their own testimony. However, I am not crazy and I certainly do not dream. But tomorrow I die and today I would like to relieve my soul. My immediate design is to present before the world clearly, succinctly and without comment, a series of simple domestic events by their consequences. These events have terrified me, tortured me, stunned me. However, I will only try to clarify them. For me they have perhaps presented nothing but horror to many people. They will seem less terrible than bizarre. Perhaps later an intelligence will be found that will reduce my ghost to its natural state. A calmer, more logical and, above all, less excitable intelligence than mine, which will find in the circumstances that I describe with terror nothing more than a succession of very natural causes and defects. In my childhood I had been known for the docility and humanity of my character. My tenderness of heart was so extreme that it had made me the plaything of my comrades. I had a frenzy, particularly for animals and my relatives. They had allowed me to possess a wide variety of favorites. I spent almost all my time with them and never considered myself as happy as when I was feeding or petting them. This peculiarity of my character increased with the years and when I became a man, it became one of the main reasons of pleasure for those who have professed affection for a faithful and intelligent dog. I have no need to explain the nature or intensity of enjoyments this can provide. There is in the disinterested love of an animal, in its self-denial, something that goes directly to the heart of one who has frequently had the opportunity to experience the humble friendship and fidelity of the envelope of the natural man. I married young and was happy to find in my wife a disposition sympathetic to mine. Observing my affection for these domestic favorites, he lost no opportunity of providing me with those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, a goldfish, a beautiful dog, rabbits, a little monkey and a cat. This last animal was remarkably robust and beautiful, completely black and of wonderful sagacity referring to its intelligence. My wife, who was deep down not a little superstitious, made frequent allusions to the ancient popular belief that she saw witches in disguise in all black cats. Doesn't this mean that she always spoke seriously on this point? And if I mention it it is simply because Pluto comes to mind at this moment. This was the cat's name. He was my favorite, my comrade. I fed him and he followed me around the house, wherever I went. I didn't care so much about this that I even allowed him to accompany me through the streets. Our friendship thus subsisted for many years, during which the totality of my character was at the hands of the demon of intemperance. I am ashamed to confess it. He suffered a radically bad alteration. Day by day I became more taciturn, more irritable, more indifferent to the feelings of others. I allowed myself to use brutal language with my wife. Over time, he still insults her with personal violence. My poor favorites, naturally, must have felt the change in my character. Not only did I abandon them, but I mistreated them. As for Pluto, I still had enough regard for him to prevent me from hitting him, while I had no qualms about mistreating rabbits. To the monkey and even the dog. When, perhaps out of affection, they found themselves in my path, my evil invaded me more and more because evil is comparable to alcohol and over time Pluto himself, who meanwhile was aging and naturally becoming a little unpleasant, Pluto himself began to know the effects of my evil character. One night, as I entered the house very drunk, leaving one of my usual taverns in the neighborhood, I imagined that the cat was avoiding my sight. I grabbed it more. He, frightened by my violence, made a very slight wound on my hand with his teeth. My original soul seemed to leave my body and a super-diabolical, 
Jin saturated rage penetrated every fiber of my being. I took a penknife from my vest pocket. I opened it, grabbed the poor animal by the throat, and deliberately popped one of its eyes out of its socket. I am ashamed. I hug myself. I shudder as I write this abominable atrocity. When my reason returned with the morning, when the vapors of my nocturnal craziness had dissipated, I experienced a sensation half horror, half remorse for the crime of which I had been guilty. But it was all, at most a weak and equivocal feeling. And the soul did not suffer the wounds. I plunged into excess, and soon I drowned all memory of my action in wine. Meanwhile, the cat slowly healed the lost eye socket. It presented, it is true, a horrible appearance. But from then on he didn't seem to suffer. He came and went around the house according to his custom. But as soon as he saw me he fled from my approach with extreme horror. I had enough of my old heart left to feel distressed by this obvious antipathy on the part of a being who had loved me so much before. But this feeling soon gave way to irritation. And then the spirit of the perversity of this spirit appeared, as if for my final and irrevocable fall. Philosophy does not account for everything as surely as my soul exists. I believe that perversity is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart, one of the first indivisible faculties or feelings that give direction to man's character. Who has not been surprised 100 times committing a dirty or vile action for the sole reason that he knew he should not commit it? We do not have a perpetual inclination, however, the excellence of our judgment to violate what is law, simply because we understand that it is law. This spirit of perversity, I repeat, caused my complete ruin. It is that burning, unfathomable desire of the soul, to torment itself, to violate its own nature, to do evil for the love of evil that drove me to continue and ultimately to upset the torture that I had imposed on the harmless animal. One morning, in cold blood, I put a noose around his neck and hanged him from a tree branch. I hanged him with my eyes filled with tears, with the bitterest remorse in my heart. I hanged him because I knew that he had loved me and because I felt that he had not given me any cause for anger. I hanged him because I knew that by doing so I was committing a sin, a mortal sin that compromised my immortal soul to the point of placing it, if such a thing is possible, outside the infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible God. In the night that followed the day on which this cruel action was conceived, I was awakened to the screams of fire. The curtains of my bed were turned into flames. The whole house was burning. Not without great difficulty. We escaped the fire. My wife, a servant and me. The destruction was complete. All my fortune was absorbed. And then I gave in to despair. I do not intend to establish a cause-effect relationship between atrocity and disaster. I am far above this weakness. But I realize a chain of events. And I don't want to neglect a single link. The day after the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls had fallen to the ground except for one, and this only exception was found to be a weak interior partition, located almost in the middle of the house and against which the head of my bed rested. The factory here had largely resisted the action of the fire, which I attributed to the fact that it had recently been renovated around this wall. A crowd was packed together and many people seemed to examine a particular portion with minute and lively attention. The words strange, singular, and other similar expressions excited my curiosity. I approached and saw something similar to a bas-relief sculpted on a white surface. The figure of a gigantic cat. The image was copied with truly wonderful accuracy. There was a rope around the animal's neck. Immediately after seeing this appearance. Because I couldn't help but consider this as an apparition. My astonishment and my fear were extraordinary. But in the end, reflection came to my aid. I remembered that the cat had been hanged in a garden adjacent to the house. At the cries of alarm. The garden would have been immediately invaded by the crowd and the animal must have been taken down from the tree by someone and thrown into my fourth floor. Through an open window. This had no doubt been done in order to wake me up. 
the fall of the other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the recently spread plaster. The lime from this wall, combined with the flames and ammonia from the corpse, would have created the image as I saw it. Although I thus promptly satisfied my reason, if not so quickly my conscience, relative to the surprising event that I have just related, it made a profound impression on my imagination. For many months I could not get rid of the shadow of the cat and during this period a semi-feeling enveloped my soul that seemed to be, but was not, remorse itself. I went so far as to mourn the loss of the animal and look around me in the miserable slums that I regularly frequented for another favorite of the same species and a similar figure to replace it. One night, sitting half-dazed in a more than infamous tavern, my attention was suddenly drawn to a black object resting on top of one of the immense barrels of gin or rum that made up the main furniture in the room. I had been looking at the top of this barrel for a few moments and what surprised me was not having noticed, of course, the object placed on top. I approached him touching him with my hand. It was a black cat. A huge cat. At least as big as Pluto. Equal to him in everything except one thing. Pluto didn't have a single white hair on his entire body, but he had a long white patch, more of an indecisive shape that covered almost his entire chest region. I barely touched him. When he got up, he suddenly broke into hoarse and continuous wheelbarrowing. He rubbed against my hand and seemed delighted by my attention. It was, therefore, the true animal that I was looking for. I immediately proposed to the owner of the tavern to buy it, but he did not agree. I didn't know him. I had never seen him until that moment. I continued my caresses and when I was preparing to return home, the animal showed itself willing to accompany me, allowing it to do so by letting me down from time to time and caressing it as we walked. When he arrived at my house he felt like he was at home and immediately became a great friend of my wife. For my part, I soon felt the antipathy towards him arise. It was coincidentally the opposite of what I had expected. But I don't know how or why this happened. His obvious tenderness disgusted me, tiring me almost slowly. These feelings of disgust and annoyance reached the point of bitterness of hatred. I avoided his presence and a kind of feeling of shame. And the memory of my first act of cruelty prevented me from mistreating him. For a few weeks I refrained from hitting the cat or hitting it violently. I came to feel an unspeakable horror of him and to silently flee from his hateful presence like the plague. What undoubtedly increased my hatred for the animal was the discovery I made in the morning, after having brought it home, that like Pluto, it had also been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance only contributed to making him even more beloved to my wife, who, as I have already said, possessed in a high degree this tenderness of feeling that had been my characteristic trait and the frequent source of my simplest and purest pleasures. However, the cat's affection for me seemed to increase as a direct result of my aversion to him. He followed my steps with a tenacity that it would be difficult to make the reader understand. Every time I sat down, he would curl up under my chair or jump on my knees, covering me with his horrible caresses. If I got up to walk, he would get between my legs and almost let me fall to the ground, or insert his long, sharp claws into my clothes. It climbed this way up to my chest. At these moments, although I wanted to kill him with one blow, I was stopped in part by the memory of my first crime. But mainly, I must confess, because of a real terror that the animal caused me. This terror was not positively the terror of a physical illness and yet it would be very difficult for me to define it in any other way. I'm almost ashamed to confess it. Even in this place of criminals I am almost ashamed to confess that the terror and horror that the animal inspired in me had been increased by one of the greatest chimeras that it is possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the white spot of which I have spoken and which constituted the only visible difference between the new animal and the one I had killed. The reader will doubtless remember that this mark, although large, was originally indefinite in its form, but slowly, by degrees, by imperceptible degrees, and that my reason long endeavored to consider as imaginary. It had eventually taken on a rigorous precision of contour. 
It was, then, the image of an object that makes me shudder when I name it. It was what, above all, made me fear the monster, horror and disgust, and which would have prompted me to get rid of it if I had dared. It was, then, as I say, the image of a horrible and sinister thing, the image of the gallows. Oh, gloomy and terrible machine, machine of horror and crime, agony and death. And behold, I was a wretch beyond the possible misery of humanity, a brute beast whose brother I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast creating for me, for my man formed in the image of the Most High God, such a great and intolerable misfortune. Oh! I did not know the rest of rest, neither day nor night. During the day the animal did not leave me for a moment. And at night, every moment, when I emerged from my dreams full of indefinable anguish, it was to feel the warm breath of the vermin on my face and its immense weight, the incarnation of a nightmare that I was powerless to shake, perched eternally on my heart. Under the pressure of similar torments, the little good that remained in me succumbed. Evil thoughts became my intimate ones, the darkest and most evil of my thoughts. The sadness of my usual mood increased until I hated everything and all humanity. And yet, my wife never complained and my ordinary pain sufferer was the most patient victim of my sudden, frequent, indomitable eruptions of a fury to which I blindly abandoned myself. One day he accompanied me to do some housework in the basement of the old building where our poverty forced us to live. The cat followed me up the rigid steps of the staircase and, having thrown me headlong, exasperated me to the point of madness, raising the axe and forgetting in my fury the childish fear that until then had held my hand, I directed a blow at the animal that would have been mortal if he had reached it as he wished. But the blow was stopped by my wife's hand. This intervention produced in me a more than diabolical rage. I freed my arm from the obstacle and plunged my axe into his skull. She fell instantly, dead, without uttering a moan. Once this horrible murder was over, I immediately and very deliberately began to try to hide the body. I realized that I couldn't make him disappear from the house day or night without running the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects crossed my mind. I thought for a moment about dividing the corpse into small pieces and destroying them by fire. I then decided to dig a grave in the floor of the vault. Then I imagined throwing it into the well in the yard. Later, put it in a drawer as merchandise in the used forms and ask an errand boy to take it out of the house. Finally I stopped at a file that I considered the best of all. I determined to wall him up in the basement as it is said that the monks of the Middle Ages walled up their victims. The basement seemed very well prepared for such a design. The walls were carelessly built and had recently been covered in their entire length with a massive mixture that the humidity had prevented from hardening. Furthermore, in one of the walls there was a bulge caused by a false chimney or type of fireplace that had been covered and made of the same material as the rest of the basement. I have no doubt that it would be easy for me to remove the bricks from this place, introduce the body and wall it up in the same way, so that no human eye could imagine anything suspicious. And I was not deceived in my calculation. With the help of a lever, I very easily removed the bricks and, having carefully applied the body against the interior wall, I held it in this position until I could easily restore the entire factory to its primitive state. Having procured a mortar of lime and sand with all imaginable precautions, I prepared a mass, a hard whiteness that could not be distinguished from the old one, and scrupulously covered the new partition with it. The wall did not show the slightest sign of renewal. I removed all the debris with the most careful care and purged the ground, so to speak. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself here at least my work has not been lost. My first thought was to look for the animal that had been the cause of such great misfortune because I had finally decided to kill it. If she had been able to find him at that moment, her destiny would have been fulfilled. But it seemed that the artful animal had been alarmed by the violence of my recent action, and was careful not to appear in my present state of humor. 
It is impossible to describe or imagine the deep, happy feeling of consolation that the absence of the detestable animal worked in my heart. He didn't show up all night. And so, this was the first good night since he entered the house in which I slept peacefully and soundly. Yes, I slept like a blessed man with the weight of the crime on my soul. The second and third days passed, and yet my executioner did not come once again. I breathed like a free man. The monster in its terror had abandoned those places forever. I wouldn't see him again. My happiness was supreme. The criminality of my dark action did not worry me much. A kind of summary had been opened, which had been immediately satisfied. An inquiry had also been ordered, but naturally, nothing could be discovered. To the fourth the day after the murder, a group of police officers unexpectedly showed up at the house and again carried out an exquisite investigation of the places, trusting, however, in the impenetrability of the hiding place, I did not experience any disturbance. The officers made me accompany them in the investigation. They didn't stop seeing a corner or an angle. Finally, for the third or fourth once, they went down to the basement. My heart beat peacefully, like that of a man sleeping in innocence. I walked from end to end of the basement. I crossed my arms over my chest and paced carelessly back and forth. Justice was fully satisfied and was preparing to leave. The joy in my heart was too strong to be suppressed. I was burning with the desire to say a word. Just one word as a sign of triumph and making the conviction of my innocence doubly palpable. Gentlemen, I said at last, when the people were climbing the stairs. I am satisfied to have dispelled your suspicions. I wish you all good health and a little more courtesy. By the way, gentlemen, see here a singularly well-built house. In my rabid desire to say something with a deliberate air. I barely understood what he was talking about. I can assure you that this is an admirably built house. These walls are going away, gentlemen. These walls are solidly made. And here, out of a frantic boast, I struck strongly with a cane that I had in my hand precisely on the wall of the partition behind which was the corpse of the wife of my heart. May God at least protect me and free me from the clutches of the archdemon. Barely the echo of my blows disturbed the silence when a voice answered me from the bottom of the tomb, a lament that was at first veiled and broken like the sob of a child. Then immediately, inflaming into a prolonged, loud and continuous scream, abnormal and anti-human, a howl, a scream that is half horror, half triumph. As only horrible harmony can come out of hell, springing both from the throats of the condemned in their torture and from the demons rejoicing in their condemnation. Telling you my thoughts would be foolish. I felt faint and staggered against the opposite wall. For a moment, the officers on the steps remained motionless. Stupefied by terror. An instant later, a dozen robust arms fell devastatingly on the wall that came to the ground with a blow. The body, already badly mangled and covered in curdled blood, stood straight before the eyes of the spectators. Above his head, with the red jaws dilated and the single eye giving off fire, the abominable beast whose cunning had induced me to murder and whose accusing voice had handed me over to the executioner was in place. I had walled the monster in the grave of my unfortunate victim. The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe, translated by Manuel Cano y Cueta, an audiobook produced by Mudbox Studio. Voiceover Juan Hernandez, sound recording and editing. Jamie Alacri Sound Editing Assistant Daniel Dominguez Coordination Alejandro Gonzalez and with the collaboration of the Alejandria Public Domain Books Portal.